My out-of-studio partner for today's program is Mike Gendron. Mike, thanks for joining me on today's program. It's good to be with you, Tom. We're currently in the Book of Romans, and we're resuming with chapter 15, and we're going to pick up with verse 23. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. And Mike, this is an interesting part of the, you know, this is, of course, chapter 15. We have one more chapter, chapter 16. But uh, he's kind of closing things out with regard to not only the letter, but, you know, he's dealing with things in general, very practical things, things that would demonstrate that this letter is to people that he knows. In many cases, we're going to go through a whole list of individuals who he greets and so on. What's your take on this? Well, we see Paul's earnest desire to visit the church in Rome, and what he's saying in verse 23 is he doesn't have any place anymore in these regions where he's been ministering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think at Brush, he might say, well, does that mean everybody's saved in the region and now we can go on? No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean all the saints have been established and perfected. But what it means is, is he's covered the area with the gospel, and rather than be settled down in the church there, he has this desire to continue to spread the gospel. That's his course. That's his mission, to continue to share the gospel where it's never been heard before. And so he has a desire to leave this place and to go on to Spain. In the meantime, he's talking about visiting the saints in Rome. Mm -hmm. In verse 22, just to back up a little bit, it says, For which cause I have also been much hindered from coming to you. Paul's whole heart and life was to preach the gospel to him. Christ crucified was the heart of it, what the Lord put on his heart to to preach and to teach. And there's great hindrance in that, isn't there, Mike? Well, there is. There's a lot of opposition, and I think uh, Paul is referring to spiritual warfare. He doesn't get specific here as to how Satan may be hindering him. It could be some direct or indirect mode that the devil is using, but he has had a desire to go and have fellowship. He has such a love for the brethren. I think it really comes through in this passage that we're studying today. But he also has a love to share the gospel and to go where the gospel's never been preached. And so, you know, this is good for us as a model that we have to continue to meet together with saints in order to be encouraged, but then always be ready to go out where the gospel's never been preached. We need that time of refreshing, don't we, Tom? Because as we share the gospel, there's a lot of persecution. And so to be with the saints periodically is a a time of refreshment and encouragement. Mm -hmm. Mike, it's a strange thing, though. Here we have the gospel. It's the most incredible gift. The penalty for sin, well, the penalty places everyone under condemnation. The Apostle Paul tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and we know that by our experience. Just look around. Who, who has not sinned? Who could you know, raise their hand and say, oh, no, no, not me. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that places everyone under condemnation. And Mike, knowing that and knowing what God has done, that Jesus Christ has paid the full penalty for our sins, and it's only in him do we have salvation. And it comes as a free gift. Now, the amazing thing is, why would this garner persecution? Why would Paul say, well, I'm hindered in in coming to you? Why wouldn't people just accept this gift of eternal life? Well, Tom, we know that there's spiritual warfare, that the lie of the devil has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ. There's a spiritual darkness in the world, and so Satan wants to hold his people captive, and he does that through seduction, through worldly influence, and through his lies. And I think his greatest lie is that you must do something to gain acceptance before a holy and righteous God. But the gospel is that Jesus Christ did everything necessary to save sinners, and so salvation is offered as a free gift through God's unmerited favor. And this is in direct opposition to what the world teaches. And Mm -hmm. we know that Satan is the prince of this world. Every religion says you must do things to gain acceptance before God. And we know that Satan is the origin of all man-made religions. That's the way his lie gets 
propagated is mm-hmm. through the religions of the world. Right. And on the part of humanity, there is self. There's that in us that says, no, we don't want to do things God's way. We want our own way. We want to be able to call the shots and so on. And certainly uh, Satan fuels that, but it didn't begin with him. It begins with every heart, uh, every heart that is bent toward doing their own thing and wanting their own way. Now, the, the sad part of that is, is that if we could just spell out exactly what we wanted, which is kind of impossible, but if that were the case, it would still fall so far short of what God has for us that it's a mind blower, Mike, to think that there are so many people you know, who take the broad way, who take the way of self and don't realize that what God has for them is so far above and beyond what they could even, as the scripture says, what they could even think or ask for. Well, that's so true, Tom. And, you know, as we look at this verse 23, when we see that Paul says he has no more place in these regions, I'm reminded of the church in Jerusalem. You remember how complacent it had become And it wasn't until Stephen's martyrdom that God drove the saints out of Jerusalem to spread the gospel. And so I think, again, we see the perfect model of Paul, that rather than be comfortable in the church that he established in these regions, he wants to continue to go where the gospel's never been preached before. Mm Mm-hmm. And somebody would say, well, that, that's good for Paul, but where could I possibly go? Maybe I wouldn't want to go to South America or over to Africa or something like that. Yet, I think right in their neighborhood, Mike, there's probably some areas, some uh, parts of the, the, their neighborhood where the gospel's never been preached, where no one's ever gone. We'd be surprised. Generation after generation seems to be so far removed from what I used to call romantic Christianity. That is, growing up Roman Catholic as as you did, Mike. Um, We don't have to go overseas. All we have to do is cross the street. Our neighbors are the ones that have probably been deceived by another gospel, and so we need Mm -hmm. to make the gospel clear to them that it's salvation by grace through everything Christ did for sinners. Or not even deceived by another gospel, but so far removed from what Christianity is, you know, where they call themselves atheists or agnostics. In other words, they don't have a clue as to who Christ is, what he came to do, and so on. So basically, Paul would say, yeah, go there. There's no foundation. They're not into a false this or false that. Oh, they've got their own ideas, but it's not according to maybe any religious group or any religious persuasion. Verse 25, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Archaea to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. And, of course, carnal means just, say the everyday things that they need, their basic needs that they have. So... As James says, we're not to just say, go, brother, and be blessed. We're to do some things that will help the body of Christ, that will help believers in their practical, everyday lives. Well, that's true, Tom. Paul is announcing his purpose to visit Jerusalem. He wants to carry a love gift to the saints there. And he's a little concerned because the love gift is from Gentile Christians. And he's going to bring this gift to Jewish Christians. And he's wondering if maybe their pride might get in the way of them receiving the gift as it was meant to be given. But this is a deliberate act of love on the part of the Gentile saints. They do it because of their love for the brethren. They realize that it's because of the gospel, first going to the apostles who were Jewish, that they now can partake in the spiritual blessing as Gentiles. And so they feel indebted to the Jewish Christians, and they're showing this by their act of love and the gift that they're giving. Right. Uh, Verse 28, When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. I don't think the Apostle Paul ever got to Spain, did he? I think his idea and what God had put on his heart to go to Rome, he didn't go to Rome the way he expected to go to Rome. But nevertheless, he got there. But I don't think he ever got to Spain, at least according to the scriptures. recorded that he did. Right. And I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, 
and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Mike, this is so important. I know there are a lot of ideas that we have, and we want to be used of the Lord and so on, but I can't think of anything, nothing, that we we ought to attempt without being prayed up, without going to the Lord and seeking Him and His help for all the things that He would have us do. Paul was such a model of prayer, especially in the area of evangelism. I'm just reminded, not only in Romans 10, which we already covered, but he had a prayer for the Israelites that they would be saved. And so it's a great model for us to pray for our unbelieving loved ones and friends and neighbors that God would open their hearts. And in Colossians 4, Paul also prayed for open doors of opportunity. He prayed that God would give him the words to say. Here we have the great evangelist of the first century praying that God would give him the words to say. And so it's a great model for all of us that we need to pray as we witness for the Lord Jesus Christ that he would open doors and open hearts so that the message would be received. And um, Paul is also making a solemn appeal here. He's uh, asking for their protection. He knows he's going into enemy territory. And any time we engage in spiritual warfare, We need to not only put on the full armor of God, but we also need to be in prayer. Mike, we may have some listeners out there. What does he mean, spiritual warfare? Could you tell us about that? Well, yeah. The uh, battle for the souls of men is a battle between the lies of the devil and the truth of God's Word. And the devil doesn't want to set any captives free. He wants to hold on to them, especially in these latter days when he knows his days are numbered. He's doing everything in his power to hold people in bondage, and only the truth of God's Word will set them free. So that's why the body of Christ needs to be ever so faithful in the Great Commission in these latter days so that we can set the captives free. And the Lord Jesus said the mark of a disciple is to abide in His Word. Only then will you know the truth, and that truth will set you free. Free from what? Free from the bondage of Satan's lies. Right. And Mike, it reminds me, you know, Paul, again, in almost every epistle, he talks about praying without ceasing, going to the Lord in prayer. And here he talks about that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. It is a battle, but it's the Lord's battle. And we're so privileged to be a part of of what the Lord is doing that we can even be co-workers. But again, that's not in any part uh, having to do with the flesh. The, The scripture says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So we need to be enabled. We need to be empowered of the Lord because it is a struggle. It's a struggle even in our own lives with regard to the flesh. And, oh, no, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be embarrassed. Self enters in. But by the grace of God, we can get past that. And it's only by God's grace that we can be used and be effective to his glory. And when we are, folks, I just have to tell you, it's like a taste of heaven to know that you're being used of the Lord to his glory and to the benefit of others. There's just nothing like it on earth. Well, Tom, you really touched on something important. The only way we can be effective is when we do things in the power of the Holy Spirit. If we attempt to do things in the flesh, then we will fail got to be through supplication, asking the Holy Spirit to empower us as we do the work of the Lord. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is TheBereanCall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the Scriptures 24-7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.